Good morning. Good morning. All right, I know last night was a lovely night, um, so we're going to do that one more time, give you a chance to warm up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's wonderful. My name is Philip Atiba Goff. I am the uh, president and co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity, and it is my absolute pleasure to be here moderating the Judiciary Committee's um, Brain Trust on Criminal Justice. Um, for those of you who are interested in um, following this and amplifying it on social media, this will be uh, streaming on our sponsor, Congressman Conyers Facebook Live page, streaming live, okay? Where do we begin talking about criminal justice in these dangerous times? I am not, of course, just speaking about um, <clears throat> the ways in which our streets have become dangerous in certain cities. I am talking about the dangerous way that our leaders have begun talking about crime. We're living in an era where the Attorney General is calling for greater law and order, which I believe, I'm not a historian, I'm an empirical social scientist, but I believe was the original dog whistle on race, um, <clears throat> and is rolling back every piece of evidence-based learning that we have made, every stride of progress we have made to get smarter on crime. For those who are interested in keeping a list, I don't know that it'll be exhaustive, but let me begin. <clears throat> Punishing low-level drug offenses does not keep streets safer. We know this because we've studied it for the past 25 years. We know that when communities do not trust law enforcement, when they worry that the penalties will be more severe than the crime, they will not call, they will not cooperate, which is why in all of the cities that have seen an uptick, <clears throat> in violent crime and homicide, it has been preceded by a significant downturn in the ability for law enforcement to clear their cases. They can't solve the crimes because the communities aren't working with them. We also know that when communities fear that there will be extra legal elements of punishment on top of regular punishment, such as deportation, that those communities are more vulnerable to crime. Because if I'm a criminal, where do I want to go most, except for the places where people are scared to call the police? Which is why we've seen upticks in black and particularly Muslim and Latino rates of domestic violence, mental illness, child abuse, and drug overdose at a time when the opioid epi epidemic is hitting everyone, but white community is the worst. God forbid you identify as white and Latino and Muslim, where you're scared to call law enforcement. So I don't know exactly where to begin talking about criminal justice in this age, except to say, thank goodness that we have more than a White House. Thank goodness that we have men and women, such as yourselves, such as the men on this panel, and the women I'm hoping to hear from later on today. Um, thank goodness we have members of, of Congress, such as Congressman Conyers, who are still fighting at the local and the state level to move things forward. So today, what we're going to be hearing from our folks, actually, we're going to have a slightly international flavor today, um, <clears throat> but folks from all over the country and all over the English-speaking world, um, trying to grapple with what concrete steps we can do in this room and we can take back to our communities in the midst of a crisis where the criminal justice system, such as it is, is being re-leveraged to re-instantiate badges of former servitude to take away what the 13th Amendment was supposed to bring to us. So today, we, I'm, I'm honored to have such a wonderful panel in front of me. We have <clears throat> immediately to my right, <clears throat> Clarence Cox, who in addition to being of the Baptist tradition, as I learned yesterday, and sporting one of the most fabulous bow tie collections at the CBC, which is a no small uh, accomplishment, <clears throat> is the current president of the National Organization of, Blacks in law of Black Law Enforcement Executives, NOBLE. That is the largest affinity organization for African Americans in law enforcement in the country. They've been influential on police reform since before it was cool, before Trayvon Martin lost his life. <clears throat> NOBLE was trying to stand up for the rights of black people within law enforcement. <clears throat> so please join me in welcoming Clarence Cox. <clears throat> <clears throat> Seated next to him, if I'm seeing correctly, is the Right Honorable David Lammy from the United Kingdom. <clears throat> uh, David Lammy is a member of parliament for, the Totten for Tottenham in North London. He was born in Tottenham, so he's repping his hometown, um, and studied law <clears throat> at the School of, or uh, of Oriental and African Studies in London. Um, called to the Bar of England and Wales in 1994, David became the first black Briton to study a master's in law at the Harvard Law School, my old alma mater. <clears throat> Graduating in 1997. 
David was elected uh, as Labor Member of Parliament for Tottenham at the age of 27 because he's an underachiever, and in June of 2000 was the youngest member of Parliament. Please join me in welcoming the Right Honorable David Lowe. <laughs> Seated next to him is Charles Coleman, um, who is a seasoned civil rights attorney who specializes in equal em employment opportunity law, human resources solutions, and the support of diversity and inclusion efforts in the workforce. By God, do we need him in law enforcement. As a former Brooklyn, New York prosecutor uh, turned civil, uh, civil rights litigator, uh, Charles uh, has extensive experience as a trial lawyer, and his courtroom acumen is matched only by his leadership abilities, which he displays thoroughly uh, through his community mobilization and civic activism efforts. Charles has appeared internationally on various media outlets as a legal, political analyst, writer, orator, and will be dazzling us with his polished words today. Please join me in welcoming Charles Coleman. <clears throat> And last but not least, is a red letter day for us, as it is for him, is Bill Cobb, who is the deputy director of ACLU's campaign for smart justice. After more than six years of incarceration, Cobb emerged as, uh, as a reentry advocate in the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia, greatest city in the history of the world. Doi, doi, doi. Um, <clears throat> he currently serves as the board, uh, uh, on the board of, uh, of Defender Association and Community Legal Services um, and is a Just Leadership USA fellow. I should say that the ACLU's work holding um, <clears throat> law enforcement accountable is absolutely essential um, in the wake of the abdication of that responsibility by the federal DOJ. So please join me in welcoming Bill Cobb. <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, I, I can't let you sit for too terribly long. Um, it is, I, I, whenever I get to do it, it is my great pleasure to introduce the man who has introduced and passed more civil rights legislation in this country than any other single human in the history of this country, Congressman Conyers. Please <laughs> stand and be <laughs> Um, so the format for today, we're going to allow each of our distinguished panelists um, <clears throat> to make brief introductory remarks, um, <clears throat> and the briefness will be known because I've got a hook like the Sandman on the side, um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll drag them off uh, into Q&A next. We will then do Q&A with ourselves, and we will then open it up to the audience. So is everybody here with me right now? Yes? yes? Okay, can I, can I hear everybody here being here with me? Yes. All right, I know we're not in a black church, but I'm always of the black church, so it's important. You don't have to say amen, though some of you may feel so moved on the day. Um, <clears throat> um, but I, I, am, I am appreciative when people do a little bit of call and response with me, all right? Um, so the first question, um, <clears throat> uh, the first, sorry, sorry, the first statement will go to Clarence Cox, and we'll go down the dais from there. Clarence. Good morning, and thank you for having us, Congressman. Certainly, Noble is engaged actively across the country in our communities in trying to provide fair and equitable justice as it's applied in our communities. And not only do we represent African Americans, but we certainly represent those from all walks of life in communities because it's important to us that it's equi equitable across the country. And we've even provided recently that I'm really proud of is some, if you will, a blueprint on how to protest. The things that you should expect from law enforcement if you decide to protest and the things that we should expect from you as a protester. Um, by virtue of our, um, our sworn duties and abilities, we are charged with protecting you as well as the folks who are protesting against your right to protest. So certainly we're glad to be here this morning and I'm looking forward to diving into this. Dr. Goff and I were on a panel yesterday and we had a, a great opportunity. My challenge to you as you leave here though is those meetings are great. I attend a lot of these. It's the work after the meeting. So don't let this just be your stop yet. Let's do something after, after what you get from here because I'm sure you're gonna be fed this morning. There's plenty of knowledge here. Thank you. Look, I'm here to remind you that there are black people in the world that speak with a British accent. <laughs> um, I'm here as a member of parliament representing um, one of the historically black constituencies in London. Uh, and I'm here because, very strangely, the Prime Minister of the UK, Conservative, uh, in a bipartisan moment, asked me to lead a review 
um, into the overrepresentation of black and ethnic minorities in the UK justice system. And I reported on that review a few weeks ago. If you put my name into Google and the review, you can bring up all of that work. And I suppose the point I want to make is that this is a global subject. Uh, America is ahead of the rest of the world uh, in so many ways and has an intractable problem, uh, I think, because of a private prison system um, uh, in, in, in large regard, an industry that has been created. But I want to remind you of the partnership across the world on this subject, because in completing my review, I went to many countries. I went to Australia, where Aboriginals make up 3% of the population, and in some states in Australia, 75% of the prison population. I went to Canada, where, as you know, Maoris make up about 15% um, of the population, and again, 50% in some parts of Canada in their pop, uh, prison population. In France, where Muslims are making up between 50 and 70% of the prison population. And of course, actually in the UK, where black men are more disproportionately represented in our prison system than here in the United States. So we have a significant issue. It is across the world. Um, we are terribly grateful for our um, African-American brothers and sisters for the fight that you have led over so many years and the consistency with which you have come back to this subject. It begins, of course, with policing and arrest rates that are through the roof. It, 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 what I've also detected is the way that states create laws that, um, that target particular communities. You know, in Australia, for example, the overwhelming reason people are in prison is for uh, drinking and alcohol-related offenses. And when I spoke to... Um, an Aboriginal woman who had been put in jail, and she said, well, of course I drink. I drink because in Australia, 65% of Aboriginal children are growing up away from their birth parents. This is the scandal in so many countries also of the care system and what it does to black and brown people. That's an example. Uh, they're, they're, they're in prison because they, are, they have alcohol-related problems, uh, but you too would drink. Uh, if they took your kids away from you in an industrial fashion. So um, I, I, it begins with arrest rates, but my review focused also on the rest of the criminal justice system. What is happening in our courts when we look at the different sentencing outcomes uh, for black and brown people compared to white people? Uh, how do our judges deal with drug offenses? What we found is that if you are a black woman in Britain, you have a 240% more likely chance of going to prison for your drug offense. Um, uh, it was really alarming, not just the men, but the women in our justice system. We looked at the charging decisions of our prosecutors. Um, we looked at how fair juries are in our system. And of course, we looked at the prison system. And the biggest problem, I think, just to end here in opening remarks, is the tipping point that this creates in black communities. Uh, and I represent one, so I know this in real time. And that is, if you get to a situation where a significant proportion of the men have criminal records, mm -hmm. then you create communities of mass unemployment, because we know that employers do not tend to employ people with criminal records. Um, I, I was struck. Uh, on a visit to the state penitentiary in Mississippi. I've been to prisons all over the world. There was something strange about this prison. I couldn't put my finger on it. It wasn't the electric chair. It was something else. And as I left the prison, I realized what it was. This was a huge prison, predominantly black men in the prison. And I realized as I was leaving that all of the guards, the prison guards, were black women. And I said to them, what's going on here? Why are there no men who are guards? They said, the white men in Mississippi don't want this job, and the black men in Mississippi can't get this job because they have criminal records. That is where we have got to. That is a tipping point that has crossed over in the wrong direction. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Congressman Conyers, thank you for having me, and, and, and I'm overjoyed to be here. Um, I think, Philip, you opened the conversation in terms of contextualizing it very, very well, and to pick up where David just left off, for me, in terms of framing today's conversation, I think it's really important that we look at it within the lens of anti-blackness and understanding that everything in terms of connecting a, a, a thread or a strand with what we've already heard and what we know we're going to talk about has a lot to do with the notion of anti-blackness as a global phenomenon. It's something that has been in place for centuries and until we continue to really call it on its face for what it is, we will struggle to unpack many of these problems. We have reached a point in this nation where we have criminalized blackness, we have weaponized poverty, and we continue to engage oppressive systems without being able to clearly identify them for what they are and the damage that they do. And so in terms of how we have this discussion today, it is an imperative for each and every one of us to use our voices to normalize the discussion around calling out white supremacy, calling out oppressive structures and oppressive systems for what they are. For all the media that I do, there's a lot of conversation about normalizing or whether we've normalized uh, racist speech, whether we've normalized bigotry, whether we've normalized those narratives as part of our conversation. And I submit to each and all, every one of us that it is our responsibility to double down on the normalization of calling out white supremacy, calling out oppressive structures, calling out anti-blackness when we see it, because those are the things that have continued to permeate our criminal justice system in such a way that has really been to our disproportionate disadvantage. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> um, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I think the problem is, um, has been articulated in a way in which we clearly understand that mass incarceration, the targeting of black and brown communities um, are intentional. Um, the continuation of punishment beyond a sentence is intentional. So what I do wanna say is um, what the ACLU and the Campaign for Smart Justice are doing about it because we don't have one criminal justice system in America, we have about 3,000 criminal justice systems in America. So first, our goal is to reduce the nation's jails and prisons population by half while combating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. We aim to do this work by leveraging the strength of the ACLU, which is the 54 affiliates in 50 states, plus Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. Um, and then we've categorized our work in four separate areas. First is prosecutorial reform. We know that prosecutors have for decades been unchecked and they wield a significant amount of power as 97% of people decide not to go to trial because they are being leveraged by high bail amounts that prosecutors help determine. So our second area is bail reform. And then in America, we are sentencing people to far too long in jails and prisons. People are doing 40 and 50 years. We are sentencing children to die in prisons when we know that they are children and have not developed mentally as adults, but yet we're holding them accountable for a behavior that transpired when they were children. And this is our norm in this country. And then parole, parole and release. Um, there are individuals who do time and they do all of their time in a fashion in which the people that are in charge of their custody deem that they have done their time and they are able to be released. But probation and parole boards um, have people making decisions about individuals that are not from their specific communities. And so through doing prosecutorial reform, bail reform, parole and release, and pretrial uh, sentencing reform, we aim to target those four separate areas throughout the entire continental United States as an effort to reduce the amount of people who are sitting and wasting away in our nation's jails and prisons and then coming home to find themselves to have been sentenced to life in inescapable deep poverty. 
So that's what we are aiming to do because this problem is pervasive and it's costing us a great deal more than it should in order to um, be safe. These are not public safety um, issues. When we think about our response to crime, our response is not to make us safer. If we deeply consider exactly what we're doing with a person once they're introduced to the system, while they're in the system, and then after their release. Thank you, Bill. All right. So, in thinking about the things that I feel like it's great for all of us to hear from this distinguished panel, um, one of the first things that came to mind was a conversation that Clarence and I ended up having yesterday, which is on part of how we are in dangerous times. Part of how we are in dangerous times is that there are so many egregious acts, so many morally contemptible acts, that it can often be a distraction from the most oppressive elements in the criminal justice system. Here's what I mean. In the United States, we know we've got about 2.3 million people locked up somewhere. We think, because we don't keep good numbers on who's locked up um, <clears throat> pre-trial. So we think we've got about 2.3 million. Um, one of the most egregious things that we hear about, it's been popularized now in movies, it wins Emmys, is low-level drug offenses. Right? It doesn't make any kind of sense to lock somebody up for smoking weed in their own house for years. And so we want to do something about that. Particularly, we want to change that at the federal level. But of the 2.3 million people we've got locked up, only 200,000 are in federal prison. So even if we solve that problem entirely, we still have 2.1 million people locked up. So the egregious is not always the most oppressive. In the same way, low level is not most folks in state and county. State and county frequently have violent next to their name. So low level, nonviolent is the language that we use, right? <clears throat> and yet, at the same time, if we let out all low level, nonviolent, that's only in, in many states and counties, only about 10% of the folks who are in there. So I'm wondering how we can balance our moral outrage with what seems like the banal, uninteresting day-to-day -day elements <clears throat> that also need to be addressed to reduce mass incarceration and secure justice, both from policing all the way through <clears throat> incarceration and, and the rest of the criminal justice system. If we can go back down this way, if we can start with Bill and come this way, <clears throat> on in terms of how we balance that. Right, so I said that our goal and objective is to reduce our nation prison population by half, and he indicated that merely 10% of people are arrested for low-level drug offenses, right? So the truth of the matter is, is that we have to address what we call violent offenders. Mm -hmm. Now, people hear the term of violent offense. I was arrested for robbery, kidnapping, criminal conspiracy, violation of the Uniform Firearms Act, for which I served six and a half years in Pennsylvania state prisons. Am I a violent criminal? Did I commit an act of violence? Well, in the description in which I just provided you, you would say yes. However, I drove the car. I was a full-time college student. I was a member of the Air Force Reserve who had just returned home from Desert Storm. And I pleaded no contest to the charges that were levied against me after I sat in state prisons for 10 and a half months without the capacity to generate revenue, money, so that I could pay for an attorney, and I merely wanted to go home as soon as humanly possible. And I'm a violent offender. So the truth of the matter is, is that a very, very small percentage of people who are in our nation's jails and prisons have actually committed a violent offense. But even after they have, is it appropriate to sentence somebody for 30 years? So we want our pound of flesh. And then we want our pound of flesh after a person has served 30 years in our nation's jails and prisons. New York City, it costs $227,000 per year to maintain Rikers Island per bed. And we keep our individual there for years. And then we are afraid to release this person because we deem them dangerous? In four years, what do we do in our country when we send people to universities? in eight years, in 12 years, but we incarcerate somebody for a significant amount more than it would take to educate an individual. We removed education from prisons as a part of the 1994 crime bill. You know what the recidivism rate is among individuals who have secondary education in prison? 
It's a fraction of a percent. You know what the cost is? $12,000 per student per year. And this is what we're making investments in in an attempt to say that we're going to be safe. So the truth of the matter is, is that we can't buy into this narrative that individuals who are charged with particular offenses that are deemed violent are literally too dangerous for us to make investments in that humanity and then to release them so that they can come back and contribute to their family, to themselves, to their community, and to our country. If they had the capacity to work when they're in state and local prisons, and for the services and products that they create to be sold to the private sector for a significant profit while paying them pennies on a dollar. We have women who are fighting fires in California and making 17 cents an hour. And those same women are released with that skill set, with the capacity to fight fires, and can't get a job cleaning a porta potty. And we do this because we deem them, I think that separating individuals based upon what they plead guilty to or what they plead no charge to because they haven't been found guilty by a jury of their peers because that's not the, what our system actually offers black and brown people an opportunity to do at a rate in which they offer everyone else. There's no equity in that. So we're fooling ourselves when we make a distinction about violence and nonviolence and then we <coughs> summarize a person's capacity to actually be a productive member of our society. Time served needs to begin meaning time served and we need to stop separating people by offenses as they were charged and as they pleaded guilty because their system didn't offer any opportunity for them to actually um, you know, argue a case where justice would be fairly administered. Philip, I think there are a number of different ways that you can sort of attack this, this question that you've answered. On a very granular level, um, as a former prosecutor, I think something that Bill said earlier sort of rung bells in my head, and that is re-examining the level of prosecutorial discretion that exists among uh, district attorneys, solicitor generals, and so on and so on, um, looking at how we discuss the relationship between police and prosecutors and thinking about different ways to reimagine that. But I want to, and you, you all will hear me talk a lot about systems because I think that when you examine how systems work and how they work together, that's when you can really start to address problems from a solutions-oriented paradigm. Systemically, right, we have to really re-examine the implications around how we police communities of color. Communities of color are over-policed and so when you talk about the, the volume of black men and women who encounter the prison, prison system, <laughs> system, that is a direct result of the manner in which communities of colors are policed. So regardless of the laws that are on the books, whether they're minimal, whether they're maximum, regardless of sentencing guidelines and so on and so forth, until we begin to really discuss and dissect police culture in America and particularly in its peculiar impact on communities of color, we will continue to have these issues. Another systemic sort of approach to, to, to your question is looking at the economics of criminal justice. And we've touched up on that with respect to privatized prison and that industry, but also everything around that, everything, everyone who profits when people go to jail, when people stay in jail, and even when people come out and are still connected to the system, right? Like that economic windfall is something that is going to stay in place. And because it's going to stay in place and it's not being addressed, that only perpetuates the, the criminal justice system functioning in the way that it does. And, and I think finally, on a systemic level, I really think, and I'm gonna go in reverse um, to what people have talked about on the panel, we have to be very, very, critical of how we examine where people enter the criminal justice system from, specifically the school to prison pipeline, right? Like there are, uh, right now, black students <coughs> represent 16% of the student population in America, but yet they constitute 27% of law enforcement referrals from schools, right? So when we are socializing our young people in a manner that has them interacting with the criminal justice system earlier and earlier and earlier for non-level offenses. I mean, we are talking about, in some cases, 
women, young girls who are having reproductive issues in contact with the criminal justice system because they have to go outside of school to get prenatal care. And then they're criminalized because of that on the basis of truancy, right? So like these are systemic problems that when we examine that or when we begin to really address, again, the economics of it, looking at entry points, and then also sort of the overall relationship structurally of how things are set up, that's when we begin to, to, to address volume issues uh, uh, of people in prison in, in the criminal justice system. Thank you. Philip, um, God, I could say so much. But let me start at the, in the early stages, and it's where, where Charles just left off. Um, the fundamental problem is the pipeline. And in the UK, we describe the pipeline as the youth justice system. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to be wary of even the phrase youth. Youth, you know, if you're at Harvard, we don't talk about youth. Uh, youth is also a euphemism for black. Mm. Um, and actually, what's the real world? The real mm. world is children. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the UK, as young as 10, 11, 12, you can be in the youth prison <coughs> estate. Um, and I'm concerned about the way we police spaces to get into that space. So again, um, uh, if you are at an Ivy League university, uh, I'm not saying this happens, but I'm going to give you paint the picture for you. You're, you're sitting in, in a, you know, in, somewhere in the university, and you are having a joint of marijuana. You may even find a professor comes and has a joint with you. God forbid. But no police in sight. That's one child. And then there's another young person in an inner city neighborhood who gets a very different set of treatments. So part of this is how we police space, what we describe as criminal, and how one group, it's fine, and another group had a different experience. The other, the other, the other underlying things for those children um, is trauma. Actually, in, in your, if you're in a, a neighborhood like mine, there's a lot of trauma. If you are seeing gun violence, we have a big knife crime epidemic. It is traumatic. Um, there are mental health repercussions. Um, so there are big issues about how are those, those, those services to support people, those health services in those neighborhoods. Um, I have met a lot of young prisoners who clearly have learning difficulties. These are fairly mild learning difficulties. These are things like dyslexia, things like ADHD. <coughs> Again, one group of children, you have ADHD, there's medication <laughs> for hyperactivity. Another group of children, there's a criminal justice response for hyperactivity. Uh, Why is that in terms of the pipeline? And then you get to prison. And the whole point of prison is not just to punish, it is to rehabilitate. So where is the education? Particularly if you're young, because most societies do not write off their young people. Uh, where is the support with your learning difficulty? Where is the support with your trauma and your counseling? You know, I, I was with one young black man, and he said to me, it's interesting, because uh, if, if, if my white colleague uh, um, self-harms, he gets all the support in prison. He gets therapy and everything to stop him self-harming. If I punch the wall, I'm self-harming, I'm angry, I get put in segregation. <laughs> so there's also cultural competency and how different communities respond to that pain. Uh, and there's a lot of new um, uh, psychiatric and psychological understanding of different cultural responses to trauma uh, and, and to pain. And then I think the, 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 the final point I'd want to make is um, when, you, when, you, when you get underneath and you've got you've to have the data and the decision making, <coughs> the thing that works best is oversight and scrutiny. 
Where individuals have the power to make individual decisions, the prison guard, the prison governor, the prosecutor, uh, without any scrutiny, no one's looking, the outcomes on the whole for black, brown, mm -hmm. ethnic minority people are poor. Mm -hmm. Where there is oversight and scrutiny and peer challenge to the decision making, there are better outcomes and you have to build that in to a criminal justice system. Thank you. It's already been said, but I think the money associated with criminal justice is, is what our main problem is because in, in several ways, we just lost our collaborative uh, reform with the, de the Justice Department, uh, Senator um, A.G. Sessions just to removed things that would create cultural competency. Because if you think about the recommendations from the 21st Century Task Force under President Obama, it gave law enforcement a blueprint, if you will, of how we should be doing business. That has just been removed. So if you look across the country at the 18,000 or more law enforcement agencies, most of them are very considered very small agencies, less than 50 people. And if they don't have rules and regulations that there are consequences if you break those, then you're gonna have these kinds of problems that we're seeing across, in, including the mass incarceration. So in the document, it also talked about the evaluation of how police officers, law enforcement people are evaluated. And in most agencies, if you were not a high performer, you're considered to be lazy. So you did not see the community policing efforts. You didn't have a, an ability to communicate with the folks that you were serving. And the, re the recommendation in the 21st century policing also recommended that the communities and the agencies resemble each other. What does that mean? That means that the folks who are serving your community should look like you. They can better understand your pain and the things that you're going through. And so if you're evaluating a guy on how many arrests he makes, that's going to increase that mass incarceration. But I'll take it even further than that. We've talked a lot about the private prisons. That's a problem, but more, even more problematic is private probation. That's where the money is really being made because if I sentenced you in the court and say you've got 12 months to pay off this fine, you can't pay the fine because you can't get a job, you're having to be brought back into the court, or rearrested, and then you gotta wait you know, in jail to try to get back out and start this whole process all over again. So that's where the money is really being made. Private prisons are making a ton of money, but it's mainly on our immigrants. Private prisons today are filled with folks that they're trying to send back across the pond, if you will, our brown brothers, and they're making tons of money off that, but their real concern is the African Americans in the communities who can't pay probationary fines who are being rearrested. So in order to make this all go away or at least get better, we've got to call for criminal justice reform in a hurry. Thank you, Clarence. It's almost at this point um, a cliche to say that the only reason why this topic has the kind of, of attention it has is because of these, right? Cell phones. Um, <clears throat> I want to add to that. I want to add to the cliche so we get the narrative right. It's these in the hands of people under the age of 30. It's not just these. I'm not holding my cell phone recording these videos, right? I, 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 I would, but it's not me doing it. <clears throat> It's young people. And I have to say, I've been incredibly impressed with how young people have organized, how, how young people have educated themselves, how young people have innovated, and have, as young people always do, decided to ignore all the chance from us older people um, <clears throat> that says, well, you can't do that. System doesn't allow for that. They said, yes, yeah, so we're going to build new systems. That doesn't mean, however, that the seats of power for social reform, that progressive organizations or progressive individuals are set up to empower those young people. And in fact, frequently what we see in the communities where the Center for Policing Equity works is we see, all right, chief, give me your community. We want to talk to the folks who are critical of law enforcement. And they bring in ministers, 
<clears throat> right? They bring in imams. They bring in the local NAACP, right? Who have consistently been advocating for change. And then we go out to the community and we see teenagers. We see returning college students. We see people working local jobs. We see teachers. And they don't go to church. They don't go to the mosque. They're not members. So there are at least, at least two sets of communities trying to make this change happen. One younger, one more established. I'm saying established because, you know, it starts to hurt your feelings after a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, how do we bridge that gap to empower the folks who are going to actually make the change? And I don't mean me. I mean the folks who have the cell phones, who are making the videos, who are creating the apps, who talk to each other on Slack while the rest of us are on, still on MySpace. Um, <clears throat> the folks who laugh, by the way, those are the young people, right? Um, how do we begin to set the infrastructure for that being possible? And I'd love to hear this first in a British accent. So, <laughs> <clears throat> David, could you break us off something? <laughs> Ah, oh, dear. Um, <coughs> so what occurs to me um, across the world is that there is definitely a movement apace in a millennial generation exercised, deeply concerned about these issues and um, angry and militant in the right places, actually. Uh, and that is a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, they have to be armed with the information. They have to understand the historical battles that have gone before. But we have to allow them to lead as well. And this is a time when, um, certainly here in the United States, uh, we have to accept that there will be a, that protests will be tough and sharp. Um, it has to be uh, as a consequence of the serious rolling back that we're seeing um, uh, in this country and across much of the world. Um, <coughs> if you look at the review that I have completed, I have written it in a sober, practical way. Uh, there's a lot of data in it. Uh, because in the end, as we fight these battles, we have to be persuasive. And that persuasiveness cannot just be about rhetoric alone. It has to be evidence-led. <clears throat> and we have to insist on that evidence leading. What was interesting is when I begun this work and I sat with Eric Holder and I talked, and this was way back almost two years ago, at that time, in the midst of a uh, general, early general election campaign between Bill Clinton and, 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 and well, the rest of the field uh, in the Democratic race, because Trump had not been selected at that stage, what people were talking about in the United States was a cross-party moment <coughs> on this subject. That you had the Koch brothers and others raising issues about cost and the federal system uh, coming at it from efficiency and money, and the Democrats questioning some of the Clinton legacy. That was the envelope then. It is staggering to come back <laughs> within the space of 18 months, <coughs> and that bipartisan space has gone, vanished, with all these executive orders and with this man, Sessions, um, doing his thing. So in the end, I think the evidence is important. The persuasion is important. Alliances beyond the kind of folk in this room and the CBC is, is, is central. Uh, but uh, for our young people particularly, there will be a degree of militancy. There has to be when you see the scale of the rolling back. Um, and if you like, the suspicion that behind much of that is those who would profit from incarceration. Great. I think in terms of millennial engagement, 
it's really important that we contextualize where we are in this moment in the broader spectrum of the movement. I think that history has a way of sanitizing our memories around how civil rights movements and how the movement for civil rights in this country evolved. It was always a youth movement. It was always a movement that was led by our younger generation. It was always a movement that included the use of technology at that time, whether it was the intentional use of television as a means of broadcasting to the rest of the world what was going on, or whether today it's the use of camera phones, as Philip has already talked about, in a number of other ways that technology has been leveraged by people far smarter than us and as, as a means of better organizing and, and, and more efficiently disseminating information. I think that it is a simple answer, but one that many of us have found far too difficult for my, my personal liking. And the simple answer is this. We have to be intentional and deliberate about our ability and willingness to not only involve young people, but also to get out of their way, Yep. Yeah. right? So passing the mic does not mean that you have to leave the stage. And right. you have to be intentional and deliberate about the manner in which you choose to support and show up for young people who have decided to literally put their lives on the line for this movement. That is of critical import for all of us to understand. It does us no good to criticize methods that we are not willing to engage in because we see them as disruptive. It does us no good to criticize the, the manner in which they may go about doing or saying or approaching certain things structurally because it differs from the way that we are. It does us no good to lambast them for having the foresight to appreciate intersectionality in ways that may, perhaps held us back previously. We have to be willing to understand and to embrace those things because that is where this movement is moving and it's moving quickly. And so I think that you know, the answer, quite frankly, is to simply just do it. Decide to do it. Decide to be deliberate and intentional about how we choose to empower our young people. I, I, I'm going to embarrass him, um, and it's okay, but you may see a young man here, and his name is Samba Sumare. Samba was a mentee of mine in a mentorship program that I run in Brooklyn, and he is now at a prep school, as a, board, as a boarding school student here in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And it was imperative that he be here today to see this, to understand that you ha not only do you have a place at the table, this is your table, right? Like this is your table and it is your responsibility to do something with it. And I think that all of us owe it to ourselves and to those of us who came before us and allowed us this space to be very intentional about creating that space for others. Um, so, because the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but usually furthest from the resources and power, youth or millennials make up a strong or a large segment of the population who has the capacity to resolve this issue. The truth of the matter is, is that 100 million Americans are living with arrest and conviction records. So not only do we need to create opportunities to drive millennials into leadership capacity, but who knows better than the individuals who have suffered being put in the back of a police car and arrested and now living with an arrest conviction or a criminal conviction that's impairing their ability to get work or to go to school or to find housing. One of the things that we're intentional about is about centering the leadership and the voices of directly impacted people. We have many organizations that are doing criminal justice reform work in the country, and they are not led by individuals who have been in conflict with the criminal justice system. Imagine an LBGTQIA organization being led by a straight white male. <laughs> funny now, right? But it's not funny when you see people leading criminal justice reform efforts who have never been in conflict with the criminal justice system. That has to change. And we are intentional about creating those such opportunities. One tactic that we're using to drive prosecutorial reform change is to get engaged in elections of prosecutors. 
Many people do not know that prosecutors are elected. So we did an education campaign and we hired 51 formerly incarcerated people in the city of Philadelphia to go knock on more than 11,000 doors of ACLU members twice, educating them with their personal lived experience about how a district attorney who had all this power that wasn't checked impacted that individual's life. We had one man who was sentenced, we actually had two people who were juvenile lifers who were sentenced to die, who had just recently been released. And they were knocking on the doors of ACLU members, <coughs> sharing their stories, and then identifying a value set. Are you against the death penalty? Are you against civil asset forfeiture? Are you for the elimination of cash bail? So with this value set, they, they raised by sharing their personal experience, and the outcome was incredible. It far surpassed anything that we thought would transpire. The most important thing, though, was that it bridged the gap in the community between a traditional, white, economically sound ACLU member and a person who still lives in that same community that they would have never interacted with. Those individuals ended up knocking on doors of people who provided them with job opportunities. Those individuals ended up having conversations with people beyond that time. And that's the contribution to the movement that's needed when we can begin to empower the young people and directly impacted people and give them the resources, give them the support. One of the questions that I always tell the affiliates is we should be evaluating whether or not we should lead, follow, support, or get out of the way. And it's what we are doing it's what we plan to continue doing throughout the country because we are talking about this and it is a sizable problem, right? And the bipartisan federal support only really had the capacity to affect 200,000 individuals who are hosted in federal prisons. Yep. But also, it does create a culture because what happens at the top trickles down to the states, but that's usually associated with money. I remember when um, Secretary Clinton was running for office and I asked her, I said, um, it's so great that you are now championing criminal justice reform. But the 1994 crime bill that you supported was front loaded with a $30 billion investment to put money in the hands of police officers and to build prisons. So are you willing to make $30 billion front loaded investments and the community has been damaged by mass incarceration? Obviously she answered yes, right? But the truth of the matter is that resources need to come with any effort, and we need to take those resources and put them in the hands of individuals who are experts on the matter, whether they're young folk or whether they're directly impacted folk or whether they're individuals who have been impacted because of family members who have also. So if there's 100 million of us with arrested convictions, that means, first of all, I ain't the only person that's been handcuffed and been to prison in this room. Mm -hmm. One out of every three black men has been in conflict with the criminal justice system, so I'm not by myself. And then somebody in here has a son, a husband, a brother, a sister, a uncle, or a cousin who's been impacted by this issue. And I'm saying to you that we have the capacity to fight and to change it. I'm telling you that the change is not going to happen in Capitol Hill. The change is not going to happen in the capital steps of your state. But the change has to happen in the communities. Hold the prosecutors accountable. Hold the police departments right. accountable. Hold your state legislators accountable. Hold your city council people accountable. They create budgets. And we spend in Philadelphia $300 million per year on local jails. 76% of the individuals in those local jails have mental health issues. 100% of those individuals come from economically depressed neighborhoods. We're watching this happening and we're thinking that we don't have the capacity to facilitate systemic change, but we definitively do. We absolutely do. Chief Cox? <laughs> He, he kind of took my little, <laughs> but you know, I said yesterday that, you know, all politics are local and certainly, you know, just to echo what he said, you know, it's up to us to make this change, us together collectively, because <coughs> even though I'm the police, I'm in the neighborhood, I'm a part of the community, I go to the barbershop and the churches and the same thing, and much like most of my members, but we continually see these people who want to run for office 
and then when we challenge them and we ask for help, they hide from us. And then they come back later on seeking money for re-election. And we can no longer have the run, hide, seek candidates. We've got to get out here and, and see, we as folks, we get all caught up with popularity. You know, when people come and they act like they know you, they know you because it's election time. <laughs> But those three or four years or whatever between the election cycles, they don't know you, they won't return your calls, and we, we allow that to happen. And the apathy of us not showing up and showing out is horrible. We don't show up for jury duty to make a difference. We don't show up when we're called to you know go out and do some activism work. I speak to communities all across this country on a regular basis, and the folks who need to be there are never there. So. I agree with the brother about the millennials. We've got to give you the power, but at the same time, we've got to educate you on our history. I spoke yesterday about the, the distraction piece. I have no problems with your right to protest. I'm with you on that. But destructive and disruptive are two different things. It is insane to me to go out here and have a great demonstration about your causes or what, whatever it is we're fighting for and then tear up a neighborhood and then have to turn around and beg to borrow money to rebuild that neighborhood from the same folks who are oppressing us and then we oftentimes can never rebuild those neighborhoods because the money is too high and out of reach. We can't do it and then we have communities like what happened in Watts. It burned down Watts and it never got its full potential back because we, we, we weren't able to afford that. So what I'm saying to you is that protest is great, but our history has shown that when we've made economic impacts, that's been even greater. When Dr. King and others went out and did protest, and you know, I remember as a kid, they went to Sears and Roebuck, and I may be dating myself, but they shut it down. Sears had to come back to the table and say, this is what we're going to do for you and your community. And we're not getting anything. And what happens also is it accidentally changes the narrative. When this thing happened in St. Louis recently, the officer was acquitted for killing a, a black man. It was a big deal the first day because we talked about the acquittal. But days later, when we started to, to destruct this neighborhood, the narrative changed and no longer was the media talking about the acquittal, which was the key topic that should have stayed in the news. We're now talking about the riot. So what I'm saying to you, sometimes we get tricked when we go out here with the demonstrations and we change the narrative and nobody's thinking about what the original issue was. So be smart in what you do. And just like he said, you educate yourselves. You go out here and look at what history has shown, things that worked. Let's do that. It's, you, we don't have to rewrite the book. Revisit the book. I, I want to jump in and, and respond to that just a, a, a little bit because I think that, and, and these points don't necessarily contradict one another, but it is important to properly contextualize how protests, particularly protests around the movement for black lives, takes place. When those neighborhoods are destroyed, when those neighborhoods may burn down, when those things happen, it's because, to be candid, they weren't worth a damn in the first place. And <coughs> it would take far less money to invest in jobs and invest in opportunity than it would to, be, to rebuild those neighborhoods once they are destroyed. And part of the problem is it's foolhardy of us to think that we can come in on the back end and say what we should, ha should not have done in response to something that, quite frankly, should not have happened, right? So I think that we have to think about things in a way that is preventative as opposed to reactionary. We have criticisms of our community that are reactionary to problems that we did not create, but yet have been responsible or made responsible for fixing. And that leads me into my second point. I think that civic activism and education is absolutely critical, but it is very dangerous if we don't engage in it responsibly. And by responsibly, what I mean is when we continue to focus all of our energy or so much of our energy simply on the action of voting, we sell short the entire process of civics 
civic engagement and involvement that is necessary to effectuate change. And we put the ability to change our own communities in someone else's hands. Whereas if we rethink what it is to be a leader right where you are, right? Like on a local level, in your home, at your workplace, in the spaces that you already have access to, then you don't have to wait for someone to get elected and hopefully pass a bill because you're already working where you are. So the challenge is, right, whether we're law enforcement, whether we're legislators, whether we're teachers, whether we're coaches, whatever it is, the challenge is to assume a level of responsibility where you are in terms of doing what you can and continue the efforts around civic education, the, re the, the efforts to register voters, the, the efforts to increase uh, voter participation and engagement and smart voting and informed voting so that those things work in tandem with each other and it's not just us waiting for someone to save us when quite frankly, we are our own saviors. I see, thank you very much for that. Um, I see many uh, sort of aspiring amens. I see a number of aspiring side eyes um, and I wanna make sure that we get to the audience. Yeah, and, and, and there's one in particular, I guess I'm looking at you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I feel like there's at least one more question we need to get to before we turn it over to the audience, which is in terms of how we make a difference in the power of data. That's right. Professional nerd here talking about data. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in both incarceration and in law enforcement, the data are terrible. Um, you may have heard the, the, the statistic that two-thirds of people who've been locked up will be locked up again. Let me tell you right now that statistic is a lie. It's closer to one third, and here's why. What they did was they polled the people who were in jail and said, have you been in jail before? Well, guess what? The people who have been in jail get locked up two, three, four, five times. Of course, folks in jail have a lot of folks who've been caught up before. That is not the same thing as once in jail, going back. So the statistic is close to, closer to one third. That's because we don't have good data on lifetime incarceration, <clears throat> right? Um, what the Center for Policing Equity does is we are data nerds on policing. So we host the National Justice Database, as many of you know. It is the first and largest uh, standardized database on police uh, behavior in the world, not just in the United States. We work internationally. Um, we collect data on pedestrian stops, vehicle stops, use of force. We standardize it so for the first time ever you can compare across cities. We also do uh, surveys of the officers. So we get at their implicit bias, explicit bias, stereotype threat, masculinity threat, the likelihood that they want to use those militarized weapons. And we also poll communities. We put that together. What most of you, I'm sure, don't know about Center for Policing Equity in terms of the data portion is, and this is where I want to start turning to y'all, it turns out that Silicon Valley, with all that money they got and don't know what to do with because it looks like monopoly money to them, they want to find something meaningful to do, which is what happens when you get so rich that you can buy the world a couple of times over. Right? The difference between your seventh and eighth yacht doesn't matter so much. You want to do something meaningful. So not only have they invested in our center, but they've put together a set of, of software engineers that are moving us from, takes all of my PhDs. We, we, I employ about 30 people full time. All of my PhDs, about nine to 12 months to write a report for each individual city. And we're fast for researchers. They're automating each step of the process. So it's going to take nine to 12 minutes. There's no police department in the country this time next year that will have an excuse not to know how much of the disparities that they see are the result of their own behaviors. <clears throat> mm. That's a big win, and that's a future for actual criminal justice reform. Data, as I have been told by nearly every woman in my life, are not sexy. <clears throat> and yet, they can be a path forward. Right, so we're going to start with Charles, and we're going to go this way. We're going to end with a British accent this time. Um, but talk just briefly, because we want to have time for questions, about what you see the role of data being, um, and what's the big win on data and criminal justice reform moving forward, if you would. I think, you know, for me, at, at the end of the day, my background is still in law. So obviously, for as impassioned as any argument may be, it's better supported with evidence. Um, I think that clearly what we do with data, how we gather data, 
is, is clear. You know, it, it's not an either or for me. I think it's, it's or, or an absolute. I think they, again, have to work in tandem <coughs> with a very deliberate effort to keep certain pieces a part of the conversation and they complement each other. Um, you know, our comp there are people, unfortunately, right, who took the same reading comprehension classes that we took. They understand analogies. They know American history. And yet and still, they will argue to... I, I have never... I have never met a racist in America. There was not a racist in America. I, I don't care how much nationalism, uh, hatred that they will say. I'm just pro-white. I'm not a racist, right? Like I have yet to meet someone who declares themselves a racist or will, in most cases, in many cases, admit that racism exists, right? So I think in some cases, uh, or for those instances, data is extremely helpful because it allows us to really add some meat to our arguments because we in this room know what the problems are. But for those people who continue to remain blind to them, uh, data is another way of really formalizing it in a, in, in a manner that you can't turn it away and you can't ignore it any further. So um, I applaud you for the efforts that you're making in that regard. And hopefully it'll allow all of us on this panel to do our jobs more effectively. Um, yeah, so 100% of the work that we do with the Campaign for Smart Justice is data-driven. Um, we are working in all 50 states. However, we don't have capacity to do the same level of work in each state. So we tiered the states based on rate of incarceration, volume of incarceration, um, racial disparities in that particular state. Um, and it just so happens that the majority of America's southern states are the worst incarcerator of people. Um, I don't wanna talk about slavery and its connection to mass incarceration because that's not very um, data heavy. However, the highest concentrations of people in cages are the areas that depended upon slave labor in order to be viable economically. Um, the other thing that drives our, our uh, the other piece of data that drives ours is that, unfortunately, there are no women represented on this panel. And we know that looking at data to that, white women are the fastest growing population of inmates in our nation. They only represent 9% of the population, well, 9%, I think 9% of the prison population. However, that percentage is growing faster. And what we would say is that they've locked up all the men, so now it's time to cannibalize a different gender. Um, so, all of, your, all of your decisions need to be data informed. We're actually identifying the primary drivers of incarceration in each of the individual states because it's very different. We did work in Oklahoma where we worked to make sure that um, decriminalization of drugs or defelonization of drugs would happen because 40% of the people in their jails and prisons were there for drug offenses. But in a state like Pennsylvania, it's significantly lower. So data will help us utilize the limited number of resources and our professional capacities to tackle these issues in a way where we can make substantive and permanent reforms. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Clarence. I love data. Obviously, being a CEO at an a organization, you, your data is kind of what drives the, the train, if you will. But I'm also supportive of uniform data um, because I just recently attended a meeting where they talked about hate crimes are only being reported 5% across the country because of the way you classify your crimes. So if the mayor of a major city says, I can't afford for my police chief to let my crime grow up, he reclassifies that crime. So when you look at the data, it's apples and oranges and it's not always consistent. So I applaud, uh, Dr. Goff's efforts, and I hope that the overall picture will become a uniform uh, uh, classification of the data because what is a rape in one community may just be an assault in another. So the data can get tricky if you don't know what you're reading and it's not a deeper dive in the data. And so I just, you know, again, I, I love that, and I think it's definitely appropriate in what we're talking about, but it has to be a uniform uh, uh, clearinghouse across the board that everything has to be consistent in order to read true and accurate data. Thank you. 
I'm trying to say data, but I say data. <laughs> <laughs> I like data. <laughs> um, it's key. Let's look at an area that's less contentious. Let's look at health. Um, as a result of the doctor knowing your cholesterol level mm -hmm. or your blood sugar levels, um, he can prescribe the right medication. He can prescribe the right activity. They can get to the bottom of your problem with diabetes, renal failure, uh, even cancers. The data is key. Um, we have had some success in the United Kingdom in the historic problem of the underachievement of black children in our schools. The data is key to the achievement of black children in schools. Um, where they are at each age, where they are when they come into the school, where they are when they leave the school, uh, and how you raise standards in education. So that is the similar case in terms of our, our criminal justice system. Um, you need to understand where people are when they arrive in your prison. You need to understand the effect of the interventions you are making uh, to get them to uh, rehabilitate. And in terms of scrutinizing these huge public agencies, I mean, in my review, I say I want to understand each court decision, each judge, each sentencing outcome ought to be transparent to the public mm -hmm. you, and broken down by ethnicity so that you can push and challenge and hold people um, to account. So uh, absolutely the data is key and arms you with the evidence base so that you're not just arguing on the basis of equality, human rights, when we know that there are some people out there that don't care about those issues, you are arguing on the basis of outcome, the outcome. You say you are in the business of getting, uh, of rehabilitating, this is not working and you can come back. Yeah. Thank you for that. And on that point, I just wanna make one note. We have new data um, <clears throat> that I feel like it's useful for folks to know about. We've talked about changing narrative and then we'll, we'll open to, I think we have time for just a couple of questions. I walked into doing some research in schools on school uh, age children's contact, school age boys in particular, their contact with law enforcement. Now, if I said to you, y'all know one of them badass kids, and those badass kids, the more they're badass when, they, when they're 12 and 13, the more likely they're gonna have contact with law enforcement later, right? That, that just makes sense, right? I'm not saying anything controversial. If you start off getting in trouble, you're gonna end up having contact with law enforcement. What if I told you that wasn't true? It's factually not accurate. The amount of times you got in trouble had nothing to do with the amount of times you were contacted by law enforcement in several of the southern cities we were looking at. But worse, it is true the other way around. The more times you were contacted by law enforcement, the more trouble you decided to get in later. Contact with police during adolescence for black and Latino boys causes criminal behavior. And if you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. I'm getting hemmed up all the time. I'm not breaking any rules. Why should I start following them now when they're not protecting me? That's the power of data. Because I'm a, there is literally nobody on the planet more familiar with police data than me. I've seen it more from more countries, more from the United States than anybody else in the history of the world. It's a low bar, but I'm still proud. <laughs> And walking in, I was just sure, because I, got, I don't have any children of my own, I got 10 grand godchildren, right? I, I, I collect them. And of my 10 godchildren, right, they're all lovely and wonderful, but I got one who's a badass kid. Like, I, I just know, if they're, if they're not kept indoors, they're gonna be out causing, causing mayhem, causing their parents and me to be worried, and they gonna have contact with law enforcement. I just knew it, except the data said otherwise. The data said that contact with law enforcement causes crime, not the other way around. And I don't know that there's anybody in this room that would have known that unless somebody had looked at the data. Mm. It's important to counter the narrative because sometimes the things we all know, those things are wrong too. So we have time for a couple of questions. I see in the lovely orange, ma'am. <clears throat>
world. Thank you. To, to look at data. Not only are they collecting data, but they're analyzing data. So yeah, again, it's important to collect data. But if you're not analyzing it and publishing, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So we are doing all these great things. We have great laws. We have profiling laws. We have accountability laws. We have um, mandates that require communities to hire people of color. Everything that could be done, we've done it. Bail reform. We have it all. But guess what? They don't enforce it. They ignore it. We have officer accountability legislations. They ignore it. We have profiling laws. They ignore it. So what we've done over and over again is we've gone to the Justice Department and says, we need an intervention because we've done all we can. And law enforcement, prosecutors, I've heard a lot of talk about law enforcement and prosecutors. Let's not leave the judges out of this discussion. Okay, because when we look at mass incarceration and incarceration rates for people in jail and we see 80, the numbers again, <coughs> data says what you want it to say. When they tell you that there's only 70 or 80 percent of people of color incarcerated and when you visit the facilities and you see nine out of 10 people of people of color, it's greater than that, just know that. But again, they're there because judges have sentenced them there. DOC or the Department of Correction is not recruiting and we can't look to them for the problems. But again, we've done virtually all there is to do and nothing has had an impact on the system. And we need the Justice Department to enforce the civil rights laws that are in place. They cannot get away with ripping us back into slavery. So we have you know, a lot of work to do. And, and let's not put it on the millennials and the kids. We as adults got to be there too, okay? But when it's all said and done, and you've worked every link, every possible angle locally, and there's no impact, we have to go back to the Justice Department. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah, you I want to much. Can I comment <clears throat> on that really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Um, really quickly, right? Um, Charles utilized the word movement. The reason that the ACLU Campaign for Smart Justice is using an integrated advocacy approach is because it we can change every law, every piece of legislation. We can sue prosecutors. But until we do the work in a way in which we not only win but build power, implementation of laws is something that we struggle to get done. So we get the legislation passed, but then it doesn't get implemented. So when you are part of a movement, your responsibility is to put people in positions of power to support their effort and to maintain the, the power that they leverage in order to continuously produce outcomes. So we can't just do it in isolation. We can't do litigation in isolation, legislation, policy reform. We actually have to build an army and then put people in leadership positions and then help them maintain those leaderships so that they can execute and practice in a way in which is going to contribute to the systemic change. So there's more that can be done, is just think about doing the work in a way in which you're acquiring powers of position, you're putting people in that power, you're supporting them, holding them accountable, and then you're continuously doing it. Because our community is what has to happen in order for change to be maintained, or, or, or change to be won, and then change to be maintained. So there's more that we can do. And I'll just say as a note of encouragement, Connecticut is the first state that wants to go statewide in the National Justice Database and use that to hold police accountable. So maybe there is hope if you're doing all those things. Now I let you make a speech because there were no women up here and we needed to hear women's voices. We're going to hear another woman, but I'm going to ask that you go ahead and, and end with a question. Oh, end with a question? Uh-huh. <clears throat> born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, McKenzie High School, class of 1987, <laughs> West Side. A <laughs> um, couple of things I wanted to add to the discussion. Number one, I am going to be inviting all of you to Charlotte. Um, we are part of, I'm a certified juvenile judge in Charlotte. We started an initiative called Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, where we looked at the disparate, inco uh, disparate impact across all systems, healthcare, how our young men are basically diagnosed ADD, ADHD, ODD, because they're acting out in class when they should be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Absolutely. We looked at um, school disciplinary issues. We looked at police enforcement. So across all systems, essentially we have created what's called a stakeholder database. And Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, we are still moving forward. 
where we have the stakeholders. So to your point, if you are a stakeholder, it is expected that you will go back to your organization, and we have partnered with all of our uh, Mecklenburg County surrounding community police chiefs bought into this. But if you are a stakeholder, it is expected that you go back to, after you take a two-day racial equity workshop through the Racial Equity Institute, we partner with the Racial Equity Institute out of Greensboro, North Carolina, who does a two-day institutionalized racism training. It used to be called dismantling racism training. But it is expected that you go back to your particular place of employment or agency. And once again, we stakeholders, captains, chiefs, all of the judges, all of the social workers, that you go back and implement change. The problem, oversight and data. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is doing it, but my colleagues don't want to do it. And I think that's where the problem is, because once you confront people with what they're doing, there is an issue. And of course, with judges, and in North Carolina, I'll tell you what they're doing now, and this is for all of you all, there is legislation to actually change the way we run for office. We are currently elected. If you're in a jurisdiction where your judges are elected, that is an important right. The judges should be the first person or first thing on the ballot you go to because it affects you locally. And too many times we're at the bottom of the ballot and people, the drop-off rate is significant. Mm -hmm. You go to the judges first. But they're trying to go to quote-unquote merit-based selection mm -hmm. in North Carolina. They're redrawing my district and actually are proposing a district that's 74% Caucasian because I ran in 2008 and our bench is 21 district court judges used to be only two now we are uh, 10 out of 21 so now everything's changing of course. <laughs> but my question is you say in with a question I, I know I had a lot of information but my question is how do we as a community speak also in line with Connecticut but how do we or how do I specifically get people, and when I say people, I mean judges, citizens, to actually get involved in electing their judges, to care about electing their judges, not just their prosecutors, but their judges, and can we have some of that data that you have? Yeah. <clears throat> so the last part was a question of data, um, yes is the, the first answer. We work in, in North Carolina. I'm happy to talk about the data we've got on police. We also partner with an organization called Measures for Justice that uh, collects yeah. data, publishes it, makes it public um, for prosecutors um, and how they manage that. Um, we're working on, on getting better court uh, data as well, um, 100%. Um, I want to go uh, down to, to Bill, though, because Bill is, is helping to, to coordinate this um, on, a, on a court level. Go ahead. So, um, Judge, the way in which you get people to understand the importance of the position that you hold and your colleagues that hold that position are not only to be present in courtrooms, but to have a visible, consistent presence in the communities in which you judge. Um, quite frequently, people who are elected show up in our communities when it's time to be elected. So there is something that um, defenders are doing, which is called prosecutorial defense where they're going, I mean, yeah, uh, community defense. So they're going out and defenders associations have arts programs, after school programs, homework programs in the communities where their clients come from. And the reason for that is because as a defender, you can't adequately defend somebody that you don't know. And that the perception is, is that public defender system in America is in cahoots with the judges and the prosecutors and the judge to throw you away. So by them having a permanent presence in that community, by them establishing relationships with individuals, once a person does have conflict with the criminal justice system as a result of being in an over-policed community, they come right back to their after-school program and say, yo, that cop just roughed me up. And that's a lawyer there with the Defenders Association who's taking notes, who's adding to a database so that when a person goes in front of a judge and they have a court-appointed attorney, they know who that attorney is. That attorney has already positively contributed to their life, so they're in a trusting relationship. And then the community has also provided them with significant data that helps them understand what the culture of policing is or how this individual acts. So I don't know what your capacity is in terms of your time, but judges need to make sure that they have permanent, consistent presence and working 
in establishing trust in the impact of communities or the communities where they're actually judging people. Um, and that's one of the solutions that I think you have the capacity to execute and where others have seen a great deal of success in establishing community relationships. One other um, point before I turn to Clarence to answer this. Um, in terms of convincing people, what we find in our public opinion uh, data is that folks just don't think elections matter. They don't think their vote matters, right? right? But even, I live in Manhattan, right? So there's it's just everyone lives in Manhattan. It's too many people. So how can your vote matter at all, right? But the, the elections in Manhattan for municipal uh, uh, judges and, and uh, DA, it's, it's 3,000 people, right? And some, in some of the, the districts we're talking about, it's going to be 300 people make the difference. So you can, you can get people to be involved to let them know, you and all your friends, that's enough. They don't know that. And so part of the education process needs to be that local elections turn by the five people that show up. Now, Clarence, I don't want to have a word, and then I see you. Judge, just let me say something to you about your ability to make juvenile reform in your community. In Georgia, we do something called the system of care, where the judges, the social providers, the <coughs> ministry, and all those folks get together. Because most of our kids have social economic issues, and it's more of, of that than it is a criminal issue. So our juvenile referrals have decreased significantly because we've got all those people in one room talking about how we can provide a service to those young folk. And the other thing is the application of your school resource officers. It shouldn't be there for disciplinary for the children. They should be there to protect the campuses for, from the folks who are coming in to perpetrate crimes on our children. So certainly if you would maybe organize those folks and, and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do because most of the time, those nonprofits don't even know who they are because they don't work together. And a lot of people are getting money to do great things, but it's being exploited. Yes. All right, so we are pretty much at time. I see one person with a microphone, one person I had called on, and here's what I, or here's how I've been also told we got to wrap because the uh, voting rights panel that's in here next, which I encourage you all to stay for, um, also has food. So we are now in the way of people coming to learn about the, the, the franchise and get food. That is a dangerous place to be. So what I'm going to ask uh, to have happen is this uh, woman here, if you would go ahead and state your question. And if you could, then pass the mic to the woman in red who will state a question. Both of y'all will keep the question brief. The panel will have two sentences that they get to reply to. And then we're going to stick around off the stage to talk to folks. Does that make, so make sense for everybody? Yes? yes. All right. Yes? yes? That's peer pressure. Go ahead. I want to thank all you for all your time and information you shared today. Um, I'm with Moms of Black Boys United for Social Change. We're a national organization of moms. Um, and I was very grateful to hear that you were saying that many of the organizations that exist to bring about change aren't <coughs> led by the people that are impacted. Our organization is built that way. And the question I had was in terms of de-escalation. Um, is there any data that supports how instituting de-escalation training in police departments across the country, how our officers are trained, um, especially impacting our young boys? I'm a mom. I'm a mom of a black boy um, who also has special needs. What, is there any data to show how value is added? You know, any time an officer approaches a situation, they bring in a negotiator. Is there any changes or data that shows when they bring in an officer who actually has that specific training on dealing with our young black boys, our brown boys, our sisters with mental health issues who have that designated training, how that de-escalates the situation and the officers are better impacted because the data has shown they don't spend hours when it comes to mental health training. Um, they spend more hours at the range on shooting you than they do in terms of de-escalating situations. We have counselors, brothers that have lost their lives and been basically their moms, which is dear to my heart, have seen their sons become a hashtag. Our organization is, as long as we are on deck, your son is not going to be a hashtag. That's a reactive approach. We want to be proactive. Have you seen data that supports training and mental health and instituting a negotiator on the same that has that impact? Okay, so before we give an answer to that, I want to make sure that this 
woman over here in, in the red has a chance to ask her question, and then data on the effectiveness of both critical intervention, mental health training, um, and on um, adolescent development tra training. Gotcha. Two-part question, very short. Um, I was a federal prosecutor for 14 years, and what I saw during my time was that there are very few of us dealing with community generally. So when I go to panels like this, I'm always interested in whether or not panelists are actually encouraging people to become prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Early on in my career, <coughs> I encountered, I had a case involving two brothers accused of robbing post offices in a violent way. One of them, I could, I could only see his silhouette in the video. My agent said, that's his brother. Looked at his rap sheet, terrible rap sheet. But because of my experience, I said, I could, to be honest, I could convict him on his rap sheet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was working in Miami at the time. I can convict him on his rap sheet. However, that's not the standard. The standard is beyond reasonable mm -hmm. doubt. I have some doubts, right? So I started digging. Let him do a polygraph exam, which is not admissible, but from my experience and having to go to sleep at night, that's <coughs> what I did. I ended up dismissing the case against that man. And my thought was, People who are criminal minded, and this is from my experience, usually come back in the system. Mm. I end up seeing that same man five years later coming into the courthouse to deliver sandwiches. You know, my thing was, let it be. And I, we recognized each other at the same time. You know, I was looking at him and I was like, because you have a lot of cases. Like, as soon as I recognized him, he recognized me. And I asked him how he was doing. And he was, told me he was doing great, he was off drugs. He had this job for a long time, right? So that made me feel comfortable in what I did way back then. As a young prosecutor who was being questioned as to why I wanted to dismiss a case. So we talk about prosecutorial discretion and maybe that's on the state level a little bit more. Feds are a little bit more uniform. But my encouragement is that when you go on these panels, you know, there's a lot of prosecutorial bashing. It will be helpful to have other people in the office to help, yes. right? So I just wanted to put that, that point out there. The second point is I also was a prosecutor in Atlanta. One thing that came to me, and this is a police issue, is that they have these policies, and I forgot what it was called, but the officers explained to me, basically, if we catch you doing something small like drinking in public. Small arrests lead to big arrests. So he, I ended up with him because he had a prior felony. He also happened to have a gun on him at the time. Fell in the possession of a firearm. It's now a federal offense. When he was just caught with some groceries trying to take him home to his family, and they caught him drinking a beer at a bus stop, mm. okay? I didn't understand that because I've never been in the state system. So my question to Mr. Cox, being in law enforcement, it goes to this issue of over-policing, mm -hmm. right? So I, th is there any sort of movement to move away from those sorts of policies? You know, and as a federal prosecutor, you're like, why are you dealing with this sort of small thing? But to move away from those policies, because I saw this young man trying to get himself together, trying to feed his family, doing something that really should have been handled with the officer telling him to move along, put it up, throw it away, or something along those lines. All right, so Clarence, you have exactly 32 seconds to go ahead and answer that question. I will answer the data question in 28, and then we will applaud for Congressman Conyers, and we will get out of the way of folks trying to learn about voting rights and eat their lunch. In your communities, you should demand, or at least in, make sure that your police department is following the 21st century guidelines from the president's task force that's the best document for any agency to provide what you're talking about to decrease the over policing and to enforce more i mean to embrace more of the community policing and to spend time getting to know your community so yes and then the other young lady who spoke about the um issues as it relates to the um i got the data and the question on the data yep. yeah yeah certainly you need to take that data and it, it really troubles me to see these uh, issues where these young men are being killed. But certainly that data of use of force, we have supported the use of force database that the FBI has created under uh, Director Comey. And we certainly agree with what Dr. Dolph is doing with data. 
on data systems. Um, and where is the woman who asked the, the question? I want to make sure I can speak to it. See, you, you hiding behind the podium over here. I see. Um, <clears throat> uh, the short answer uh, is that the data are complicated. Um, trainings are not sufficient. No training is sufficient. Um, the thing to keep in mind is training is the best way in law enforcement to communicate values. But if the values of the actual behavior in, in law enforcement are not consistent with the values of the training, you're training cops to be hypocrites. And too often what we see is anti-racism uh, training or diversity training or sensitivity training in a law enforcement uh, agency that does not actually embrace those values. I'll tell you one quick story. We're training folks in a department that shall not be named. Um, guy walks in, arms crossed, doesn't want to hear anything we got to say. At the end of it, he comes up to me crying and angry. Now, crying in law enforcement is not a common thing. He says, you made me less safe because you made me more fair. I'm going to go out on the street. I'm going to embrace this stuff because I think it's the right thing to do, but I know my shift lieutenant does not agree with me. And if I speak up about this as I am prone to do because I can't keep my mouth shut, I'm less fair. Right? I'm more fair. I'm less safe. People aren't coming to my, to, to when I call. So there is no training that happens outside of the culture of a department, and therefore there's no training that has a uniformly positive effect. Um, many trainings actually have a backlash effect where they make the situation worse mm. depending on the department that you're walking into. So there are good trainings, but none outside of the culture of the department. With that, I gotta thank you. Please stick around for the voting rights. Please give our panelists a, a round of applause. Thank you. Keep caring about these issues. Take these back to your community. Folks, we're gonna have a picture with the. Uh, we hope you'll join us for our 11 o'clock panel.